So today's lecture is going to be on the 20s. What we see here is we have an image that I've selected to represent the 20s as we see Calvin Coolidge in the background singing music, praising big business as it dances and has a good time in what we call the Roaring 20s. The 20s are called Roaring because business was good again. Americans are tired of progressivism, they want to make money, and we will see that there is a good time for many in America, especially in the cities and big business, and it's a focus of having a good time and making money. So today's, this section of the notes is about the immediate post-war period, the years 1919 and 1920. The United States has just gotten out of World War I, and Woodrow Wilson had promised people that the, war, the World War I would be the ultimate progressive dream, that it would be the war to end all wars, that it would bring democracy to the world, that it would end colony, um, that it would end, uh, end empire and green, green, give people ethnic self-determination. When that didn't happen because the Treaty of Versailles is voted down, the United States does not join the League of Nations. Uh, there will be future wars. There is empires, if anything, have gotten bigger for England and France. In the United States, people feel very disillusioned. They look at what progressivism led to, the idea that we're going to make the world a better place. And as you can see in the picture, the mood or the tone of America is that progressivism was a falsity. It didn't lead to anything. It just led to death and destruction. We didn't make the world a safer place. We don't legal join the League of Nations. And so Americans are sick of getting involved in now other people's problems. So the height of progressivism is World War I. We're going to make the world a better place. But when that doesn't happen, Americans again say we're not interested in helping out the rest of the world. And so as we will see in the 1920s, Americans for the most part want to be isolationist. So the United States is going to stop trying to save the world and focus on what happens just here. Let's focus on making business for us. Number two, the death of progressivism. Not only are people going to want to be isolationists as a result of the failures of World War I and the Treaty of Versailles, but they're also going to want to give up on progressivism. From 1900 to about 1918, Americans were in the mood to go fix society, to improve our prisons, to improve education, to get rid of alcohol, to make cities better, to make government less corrupt. All of those middle class progressive ideas accumulated in World War I. Again, Woodrow Wilson told the American public, promised us, that progressivism would make everything better. And it didn't. It just ended in 53,000 dead American soldiers. And so when it doesn't work abroad, we also think that it doesn't work at home. Americans are no longer in a mood to try to make society better. As you can see in the picture, we just want to have a good time. We're disillusioned with progressivism because it didn't work. And so we want to go back, kind of a return to the Gilded Age. We want to be very pro-business. We want to make money and we want to have a good time. We will not see the likes of Jane Addams, Florence Kelly, um, Teddy Roosevelt, those kind of characters in the 1920s who want to lead the government to make things better. It's just about having fun. So 1919 is a very tumultuous year. Right after World War I got over, there is going to be, as there often is in the United States, a post-war recession. The economy needs time to adjust to go back to a peacetime economy. And so what we see as some of the causes of this 1919 labor unrest and the bad economy is we see post-war inflation. For several years, uh, we haven't made consumer goods. We've made war materials, machine guns, tanks, uniforms, those kinds of things. Um, and when the war is over, Americans want to buy consumer goods. They want to buy dresses. They want to buy washing machines. But they can't. Factories are not geared to make those consumer goods anymore. So the few washing machines or dresses or automobiles that are out there that are being produced are very scarce. It's a simple laws of economics. There's a very high demand among American public who hasn't had consumer goods in a while because of the war, and there's a very low supply. So when you have a high demand and low supply, that makes prices go up. And so that's what causes post-war inflation. Prices for consumer goods are extremely high, and Americans just can't afford them. Prices keep going up. Add on to that, the factories start to cut people, cut people's jobs. They start to lay people off. As factories start to retool, which means that the factory, which was all set up to make machine guns, they're now going to have to close down their factory, 
take out the machines that make machine guns um, and, and then put in machines that make uh, dresses or that make automobiles or that make dishwashers. Um, and so that takes some time. And so while that's happening, factories and businesses are going to start laying employees off, cutting down their wages or their work hours. Um, and so we see that these two things happen. It's a double whammy for workers. Just at the time as prices are going up, they now have no longer to have jobs as they can't afford anything anyway. In addition to that, the labor market is even made worse because we have a million American veterans coming back from the war looking for jobs. So at the same time that we're cutting jobs and prices are going up, now we have all these unemployed veterans making the job pool even more numerous, which means we can now cut wages for workers even more because we have a surplus of labor. And then finally, we see immigration start again in 1919. Amer uh, people in Europe trying to escape the poverty and the destruction of World War I, they start to come to America, adding more workers to the available labor pool, um, further lowering wages. So for these two primary reasons, we're going to see that we will have an economic recession. Examples of this is we see several strikes sweep America. 1919 is going to see some major strikes as workers protest job cuts, as they protest high prices and not enough paychecks to deal with these high prices. And so I'm going to give you an example of two of them. The first one is the Seattle Longshoremen strike. Seattle is a major port on the West Coast, and 60,000 longshoremen, men who load and unload boats, um, put goods onto trains, they just stop working. And so the United States can't sell their goods to other countries or buy goods from other countries. And this will basically shut down a good portion of the economy on the West Coast, making the economy worse. But it's a great example of how workers feel that they need to do something to, to fix uh, their situation where they're having low wages and they're having high prices. Perhaps more spectacular is the Boston police strike, another strike that happens in 1919. The policemen's union has not had a raise in a while. We see high inflation, and so the policemen decide to go on strike. Now, when a city the size of Boston has the police go on strike, mayhem will result. And so the governor of Massachusetts, a guy by the name of Calvin Coolidge, pictured on the bottom right, he decides that he is going, that this cannot happen. He is famous for saying there is no right to strike against the public by anybody, anywhere, anytime. And he basically busts the policeman union. He has the mayor of um, Boston fire all of the police officers that went on strike, and they replace him. And in the meantime, he sends in the National Guard to keep order in Boston. And so we see that the 1920s is, is in a very real way a return to the Gilded Age. Once again, we're seeing government come in on the side of the management during uh, strikes and side with the management and against workers. We're not going to see Teddy Roosevelt come to the rescue anymore or Woodrow Wilson. Um, and so it is in many ways the 1920s will be a return to the Gilded Age. And so we see all of these strikes cap happening. And this concerns Americans because we ha we're going to have what is known as the First Red Scare in 1919. 1920 and then a little bit more into the 1920s. The red scare, red is the color of communism and Americans are going to be afraid that communists are trying to take over America. Now there's some evidence for this in the American public's mind. All of those strikes happened in 1919 and the public associates labor unions with communists. Now, labor unions are not communists. They're not trying to take over America. They just want higher wages, safer working conditions. But in the public's mind, some of these violent or large labor union strikes seem to be um, the first call, uh, the first step in a communist revolution to take over America because unions are made of workers and communists are workers. They're both rising up. And so the American public thinks that this is the first few steps in an eventual communist takeover. In addition to that, just in 1917, communist workers overthrew the government of Russia um, and you know redistributed the wealth. And so Americans have seen communism take over in another major country in the world just a few years before. They see all these strikes occurring in America. And so they think it's a precursor to a government takeover. In further evidence to make America paranoid is we see a series of terrorist attacks in 1919. Um, what is assumed as communists and anarchists are putting uh, 
bombs in the mail and sending them to prominent Americans, uh, prominent businessmen, prominent politicians. Over 40 of these bombs will go off in the United States in 1919, creating a hysteria. Again, that this is further evidence that the communists are trying to take over. Um, one bomb was even sent to the Attorney General's house, the top lawyer for the United States government, um, and, and it didn't kill him. But it is going to scare people in America once again that there is a communist uh, plot afoot. And so we see on the left hand side, we see a political cartoon from the time and communists are sneaking into America and his, his um, knife says Bolshevism, which is communist, communism from Russia, and then he's carrying a torch of anarchy, might light the United States on fire. And so we see, as I said on the previous slide, lots of immigrants coming to America, a lot from Eastern and Southern Europe where communism is strong. And so Americans, in the face of all of these strikes, the overthrow of the, of the Russian government, all of these terrorist attacks, these mail bombs, and this increased immigration, we're going to have this fear that communism is everywhere and they're going to take over the United States. So what does the United States do about it? So number four, the rape scare continued. Attorney General, the same guy who had his house targeted with a bomb, he is going to launch a series of raids. They're called the Palmer Raids. And so here we see A. Mitchell Palmer in the picture, and he is going out and trying to round up communists. We see a policeman in the back scooping them up. And if you look in the very back center of the picture, you'll see somebody tossing a bomb, an allusion to the, to the mail bombs. And so we see the United States is going to try to round up communists, people who are suspected of being communist anyway. On the bottom left-hand part of the picture, you'll see two workers. One's carrying a hammer, one's carrying a sickle, which is the symbol of communism. And so the United, so A. Mitchell Palmer, who certainly is his personal for him, he decides that this is a threat to America, and so he's going to use the full might of the United States government to go after people. And so the Federal Bureau of Investigations is going to hire J. Edgar Hoover. He's a young man in the FBI at this point, and it's his job to go help a. Mitchell Palmer round up the communists. And so what would happen with these Palmer raids is the United States government, the FBI, would get a tip that you might be a communist, and they would knock on your door, um, and they would arrest you. Now, you may or may not have been involved in any terrorist attacks, or you may or may not have been involved in any mail bombs, but your, your crime, your sin, is that you are a communist, and the United States government is afraid of you and your political views. And we'll see over 6,000 people arrested not necessarily because they committed a crime, but because at this time, many Americans are fearful of their political viewpoints. And so we can see this as perhaps a synthesis. We can compare this to other times in American history where Americans face a crisis, whether it's a war or a feared war, and they start going after people and ignoring their civil liberties. We saw this in the Alien Sedition Acts, the Espionage Act during World War I, during the Civil War when Lincoln takes away habeas corpus. And so this would certainly be an interesting synthesis to talk about um, in your essays. In addition to that, here's another example of the Red Scare, is 249 of the suspected communists, because it's not necessarily proven all the time that they're communists, are going to be deported and kicked out of the United States. And we see this in the picture as A. Mitchell Palmer is kicking people out of the United States with his foot. Um, and they get put on a ship that's dubbed the Russian Ark, and they're sent to the Soviet Union. One of the most famous examples of this is going to be um, Big Bill Haywood, the leader of the, the Wobblies or the International workers of the world, the Communist Party in the United States. One final example of the Red Scare in America in the 1920s, 1919, um, is that um, in the New York legislature, five people who were socialists, not even communists, people who do not believe in complete government takeover of the United States, just over certain key industries, that's close enough for most Americans. And so we'll see that these socialists will be targeted and attacked. And five duly elected representatives from New York will be expelled from their positions because we don't like their politics. And so once again, and we see that freedom of speech, freedom of thought is being um, called into question during the Red Scare. We certainly have reason to be concerned about communism, um, but we do see Americans become wrapped up in this, in this post-war hysteria. So here is one anti-communist who put it pretty succinctly how he feels we should deal with communists. He says, I believe we should place them the communists, all on a ship of stone with sails of lead, and that their first stopping place should be hell. 
Um, and so this, I think, I put this quote in here because I think it certainly captures people's concern and hysteria about communists here in America. In America, we'll talk more about communism as we get further into the 1920s, and the Red Scare it will continue. So the next year, the Red Scare continues into 1920, um, and there is uh, another bombing that happens in the United States, and it's the Wall Street. Wall Street is targeted. You see some cars that have been overturned in the explosion. And again, this feeds the hysteria in the United States that the, you know, the communists are trying to take over. Um, and they pick Wall Street because it's a symbolic target. Uh, it's a symbolic target of capitalism in America. It's where the business district is centered. Um, and so we see Americans start to freak out. Um, and so Palmer warns the United States that there is going to be a communist takeover on May Day. It's a day in May that celebrates the workers in the world, the workers in the United States, and we associate common laborers with communists. Um, and so we see this political cartoon warning America that workers are going to unite, they're going to overthrow the United States. And we see, if you look in, in the bottom part of that picture, it says Haymarket. This is, again, an allusion to um, the problems we had in the the Gilded Age, where we had lots of violent strikes. So here is yet another example of how the 1920s is going to mimic the Gilded Age. Americans are afraid of unions. Uh, they're upset with labor unions. They don't like them. They don't want the government to help them like we did in the Progressive Age. And so A. Mitchell Palmer puts the United States Army with the United States government. They put the, the army on alert. Police stations all over America are warned that the, there's going to be a government takeover on May Day. And then nothing happens. There is no government takeover. Um, there are a few demonstrations, but they're not that big. Um, and so the American public certainly is going to continue to be scared of communists, and the Red Scare would continue, but not with the hysteria. When A. Mitchell Palmer promised Americans to, to look out that this is going to be a takeover on this day, and it doesn't happen, um, Americans are going to think that this was uh, maybe much ado about nothing. And so we're going to see um, that, con that people aren't as hysterical after the failed or or non-existent May Day um, marches and communist takeover. So when we come back, we will talk about industry and invention in the 1920s. So talking about the capitalism and the roaring economy that will result.